a structure of viruses. Um, and it's a very fascinating topic, so I'm excited to be here today. Um, I'm not a teacher, so <coughs> I'm, I might be sloppy and um, I need you all's help uh, with the class, so interrupt me, ask questions. And there are some difficult complex, uh, difficult uh, concepts that I want to explain. So um, let's see how that goes. So uh, let's start by uh, taking a look at the viral infection. So what's going on here, we have here a, a virion here in pink that has found a cell that can infect. So how, how does it know that it can infect the cell? Well, the surface of the virus, the capsid, is specific to the surface of the cell. So it's recognizing the cells through this capsid, and it's making the genetic material to go through the membrane inside the cell. So now this genetic material can get picked up by the ribosomes. So viruses can use different types of uh, nucleic acid to encode their information. So what would you think that nucleic acid is? In the back? RNA, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, viruses that have positive RNA, uh, they can they have signals in the RNA that uh, make them uh, recognizable by the ribosomes. So this uh, genome is directly recognized by the ribosome, and now the ribosome is producing the viral proteins. So we have here this protein in orange, that is the polymerase, that is going to start making copies of the genome. And then, uh, as the viral cycle progresses, uh, we see an accumulation of all these pink blobs that are the, the, the capsid protein. So, at some point, all these blobs are, are going to interact with each other with different uh, chemical interactions. And they're going to recognize the RNA and they're going to encapsulate it. So, this is a process we call assembly. And so you can tell here the RNA is kind of twisted. So it's a single stranded molecule, but it has complementation uh, between different pieces of the sequence. So it has a lot of secondary structure. So we depict the genome as a line, but it's actually more like a, like a ball of yarn. Um, so now we have all these um, new particles that we call virions that are going to go outside the cell and they're going to go infect a new cell. So now the genetic material is protected by this protein, by this shell or coat or capsid. Um, so there is something that's common to all viruses. And that is that the capsid is going to be made by different subunits. And this is, this has a very simple reason. It's impossible to make a protein that is larger than the gene that is going to encode for it. So we have three nucleotides that are going to make a small amino acid. So the larger the gene, the bigger the difference is going to be between the protein and the side of the DNA, or the, or the RNA in this case. So in this lecture today, we're going to see the methods that we use to study uh, virus morphology, um, the, type, the types of structures that we can find in the viral world. Um, we're going to see what we understand by icosahedral symmetry. And this is where things are going to get more um, complicated. We're going to see what quasi-equivalence means. Um, the triangulation that's going to give the different T numbers. That's, this is a way to uh, describe 
how these different cassettes and units are going to uh, interact with each other to form this uh, big geometric structure. We're going to see some examples. Uh, there are also viruses that uh, look like filaments, so that those have helical symmetry and not icosahedral symmetry. Um, hopefully we will have time to see how viruses can assemble and disassemble, and some viruses also have an envelope that it's basically a membrane that they catch from the host. So viruses come in all sizes and shapes, so we find uh, icosahedral or close to spheric viruses uh, we find some filaments like tobacco, uh, tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, we also find bullets. Um, and then we also have giant viruses. So this one is in color because we can see with a light microscope, but the rest of the images comes from an electron microscope. So The electron microscope is, uh, is a good tool for studying uh, virus structure. So the main difference uh, between an electron microscope and the light microscope is that we use electrons instead of photons just because we're, we want more resolution. So this is a, a FEI technique that we have in SRTC, uh, sorry, Science Building 1 uh, in the basement. And we use this machine frequently to look at our samples. Um, so we, we put the specimen here that it's uh, our sample in a tiny copper grid. Um, and then there is an electron gun on the top that's going to shoot a beam of electrons. And different magnets are going to act as lenses. And then uh, everything is going to get projected down here. And we can get the image from there. Um, so how do we stain this, our samples? We can use a uh, negative stain that is pretty simple. This is uh, the only one I'm familiar with. Um, so why it's called negative stain is because we don't actually see the sample, we see the shadow of the sample. So we use um, a solution that is electron dense, like uh, uranyl acetate, for example. Um, and that's going to accumulate in the, in the little um, holes in the in the structure and, and also between the, the surface of the grid and the particle. And that's how we get these images. We have the electrons here. They are not going to pass through these electron dense parts. And then we get that uh, image. <coughs> we, we can also have an infected cell, for example, infected tissue, and we can make very thin slices with an ultra microtome. And then we can stain that and visualize, and eventually we can see different particles there. Then um, there's an, uh, another technique of electron microscopy that is called the cryo EM. Um, and this is basically because we're using frozen samples. Uh, these allow uh, us to get more resolution. And this is a machine that is down at the waterfront. Um, uh, Steve Reichel uses that machine. So, how, how can we get uh, a model of the structure of the virus just by getting these B dimensional images? Well, we can do single particle reconstruction. So if we, we have a sample and we have uh, a big number of these bidimensional uh, images, we can pile them uh, on top of each other and then we can use computational tools to build the three-dimensional structure of the virus.
Another way that we can study viruses, uh, viral structure, is X-ray crystallography. In X-ray crystallography, what uh, we need to do is we need to get our uh, sample crystallized, and that's basically having all the particles arranged in a regular way in a, in a small crystal, and then we have that crystal here um, <clears throat> we shoot a beam of x-rays to it and then all these uh, particles are going to um, cause a diffraction in the beam that we can detect and that is going to look something like this which doesn't tell you much unless you have again the computational tools to make it make sense so from this you can you can have an electron density map. And if you know the sequence of what you're looking for, you can try to fit that into the uh, electron density map, and then you get a protein model. And then if it makes you happy, you can actually 3D print that model and have it in your hand like we have all these viruses. Um, so we, we can see in very general terms uh, different uh, types of virions. We can see spherical virions like this one, and these ones have icosahedral symmetry. We can find uh, filaments, and these have helical symmetry. And then there are also complex viruses like FHD4, and these are uh, combination of these two plus variations plus different elements to form this virion, uh, you need more than 20 different proteins. So uh, kind of challenging the idea of just using one subunit to make this big thing. Um, then we can find variants of these different ones. Like for example, if we look at the head of this phage, it's not a sphere, it's not a icosahedron, it's slightly elongated, and that's because it has like an additional feature that is going to give it that shape. I have here a really cool example as well. This is called a Gemini virus, and this is basically two spherical uh, capsids put together. Uh, and then we, we also find viruses that are enveloped. They have a membrane around them. So we can make it when they don't have this envelope. So let, let's see what principles uh, are common in virus structure. Well, we can apply the this principle, keep, us, keep it simple. Uh, Viruses are really good at minimizing and being very simple in the way they operate. So they always try to get uh, very small and they use um, different strategies for that. Uh, genetic economy is uh, what I was uh, telling you about before. The nucleic acid is going to be too big. Uh, for having a single protein to protect it, so they need to make different subunits that are going to assemble together. And in some cases, the capsid gene can make up uh, up to half of the genome. And because of the difference between the size of the protein and the size of the nucleic acid uh, is larger as the nucleic acid is bigger, we're going to be needing more and more subunits as the genome gets larger. Then we find symmetry uh, in most of the cases. It can be icosahedral or helical. And then we have a paradox as well. We want the virus to be very stable and resistant, so when it's, go, when it's outside the cell, it doesn't fall apart. But it also needs to get the nucleic acid out once it's inside the cell. So one side is very resistant, 
on the other hand is very easy to open and that's what we call metastability. It's uh, a virion, it's a metastable structure. So let's talk a little bit about icosahedral symmetry. So here is an icosahedron and we find different um, axes of symmetry in this structure. We, we find, um, let's start by the five-fold axis. That would be the vertices of the icosahedron. So that means that if you rotate this, um, what is it, 72 degrees, that is basically 360 divided by five, you find the same image. Then there is a threefold axis of symmetry that would be the size, sorry, the side of the icosahedron. So if we rotate uh, 60 degrees, no, what is it, 120, um, we find same image. And then we have the twofold axis of symmetry that is going to be the edge here. And then we need to rotate 180 degrees to find the same image. So viruses find uh, this symmetry when they assemble their, their capsules. And here we have an example of, a, I, would, I would say it's a fictitious, it's not a real virus. Um, Question? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, I was just wondering, do the capsids retain their shape after the gen genetic material is released out of them? So it depends on the virus. Um, some viruses <coughs> they just uh, fall apart, so the difference of units just fall apart because the the environment in the cell makes all the interactions uh, to to stop and they fall apart. Um, but others, they just release their genetic material. And honestly, I'm not sure what happens with that empty um, capsid. So in this particle, we can see the different um, axis of rotation or axis of symmetry. We have here the five-fold symmetry axis. Um, we can see that in each of the in each of the sides of this pentagon, we have a difference of unit. Um, then we have here would be the this is the side of the icosahedron, and here we would have the three axis of symmetry, and here it would be the two axis of symmetry. What we can see here is that each of these subunits is interacting with the rest of them in the same manner. Um, but it's, the interactions are going to be different in each of those uh, axes of symmetry. So we, if this is like a hand, we can see that the wrist is interacting with other wrists in the fivefold uh, symmetry axis, but then the fingers are going to interact with each other like this in, in this uh, axis, um, the same with the two-fold axis. So at the end, what we have here is a, a particle that has 60 different subunits. And why 60? Well, we have five uh, in each five-fold uh, axis of symmetry. And then, because this is the vertex of the icosahedron, there are um, 12 of them in an icosahedron, and then the total would be 60. Um, is this clear? Do we have any question? Um, sometimes you can get confused, because what you're seeing here is a pentamer, and you can be like, well, what I see there is not a cosahedron, it's a dodecahedron. 
So what I what I want to point out here is that uh, they both have the same symmetry. So uh, dodecahedron is basically a truncated icosahedron. So same with here. What do you see here? Do you see an old lady? Could see an old lady there. Okay, you can also you can see an old lady. This is the nose and this is the mouth, but it, it, this can be also a young lady looking um, looking back. The same with these structures. So uh, yeah, you can see a dodecahedron, but this, let's stick to the idea that this is um, an icosahedron because of what I'm going to explain next. But I guess what I want to point out here is that what we, when we talk about icosahedral symmetry, we are not talking about viruses being an icosahedron. They just have icosahedral symmetry. It's not the same. So we have seen how 60 subunits can form this icosahedral capsid, not icosahedral uh, capsid with icosahedral symmetry. But when we look at the viral world, uh, we find a big diversity in, um, in variant structures. And here we have uh, different capsids separated uh, by color based on how many subunits are going to make each of those capsids. So we look here on the number of capsomeres, that's how we can call these different subunits. Uh, we see that the ones that have 60 are just the red ones. So what happened to the rest? How can we make the rest of all these capsids and have this difference in sizes? Well, you can also observe something here in the numbers, I, is that they are all multiple of 60. So how is this possible? What's the geometry? that is behind the assembly of the rest of all these capsules. Well, there were um, two, two scientists that were trying to answer this question in the 50s and 60s, and those were Caspar uh, and Klug. Um, they were um, they were buddies with uh, Francis Creek and his buddy that I'm not going to name, and Rosalind Franklin. Uh, I've heard that Caspar had an affair with Rosalind Franklin. And they were um, trying to figure out what's, what's going on uh, with these capsids. And they came across the work of this designer and architect that's called, he was, it's called Buckminster Feeder, I don't know if he's still alive. I don't think so. Um, well, he, he, he was the inventor of these geodesic domes, like the one in the, the expo in Montreal. Uh, what he was doing is these big structures that is basically putting triangles together in an hexagonal fashion and making them into a big sphere. What, what is, so how could he do this just with hexagons? Because you put hexagons together and what you get is basically a flat surface, like we can find different, different ones in nature. Uh, well, he, he found that you can put curvature into into these patterns by introducing pentagons. So, sorry. So here, for example, you, I could find a pentagon there. I couldn't find any other one. So you can put pentagons in this hexagonal grid and then make a sphere. Um, this soccer ball uh, was also inspired by Fugger. Um, and here, when you have this, all these hexagons, and then you put pentagons in between, and you get a ball. So it was a good way for the soccer ball 
um, factory to find out about this because now you can make a bow uh, made of 42 different, is it 42? 32, I think. Um, different pieces. So here we will have 12 pentagons and I think there are 20 hexagons. And I have a question. If you want to make a, a ball uh, that has, instead of uh, 20 hexagons, it has 200 hexagons, how many pentagons would you need? 120. 120? Did you say it was 12? Yeah, so here you have 12 and 20 hexagons. Um, another answer over there? Yeah, so you just need 12. So it doesn't matter how many hexagons you have, you can have millions of hexagons, you just need 12 pentagons to make that island sphere. So if you have these pentagons in a distributed regularly in this structure you get, you can get a perfect sphere. So that's basically what viruses are doing. Um, Feeder also uh, worked with tensegrity, and this we have here another tensegrital structure. So these are just sticks and, and a rope. So you cut a rope any any point here, and all these structures fall apart. And the same as here. It's just some sticks and, and ropes, and it's a flexible structure. If you press, then it comes back. So why I want to point out this, because um, Kaspar and Klug also got some ins inspiration from these tensegrital structures. We usually think of uh, vital capsid as this uh, rigid um, ball, but viruses also have elasticity as well. So in a virus, uh, there are no ropes, but there are chemical interactions that are going to maintain the shape of the virus. So on one side we have the protein subunits of the capsid that are interacting with each other. And on the other hand, we have the nucleic acid that is tightly packed inside that's pushing this structure outward. And the compensation of all these tensions, and this is why it's called tensegrity, because of all the tensions, is going to keep the shape of the virus. So what's the theory of quasi-equivalence? How can you fit all these hexagons between the pentagons to have uh, a sphere of any size? Well, what they came up with was with um, a planar representation of, of how you can arrange the different subunits in a capsid. So here, let's look at the background of this image. We have a grid of hexagons, the, like the ones I was showing before, and then we can connect each of the centers of these hexagons by lines to form triangles. So in a virus, each of these blue circles would be a different protein. Now we, we take an icosahedron and we're just going to look at one of the sides of this icosahedron. So the side of the icosahedron is a triangle and then we can make triangles based on this grid. So let's start by the uh, simplest case. Uh, this one, for example, has um, the triangle of the icosahedron. It's just a triangle of this grid, and then you have in each of these sides, you have the, uh, three different subunits, and then this is going to be a particle with a total of 60 proteins. So this is like the fictional virus that I showed before with the hands. So we have um, in the three axes of symmetry, we have three different uh, monomers. 
Um, but let's turn now to build uh, different um, sizes of particles uh, in different ways. So this is uh, this would be the next one in complexity. This one. Uh, the triangle, and this is called triangulation because of the different ways you can build, you can put the triangle in this grid. Here we have um, this orientation in the grid, and now what they they came up with uh, this formula that uh, is going to give you a number uh, that is called the triangulation number. So to to know what number is what number is for a particular vital capsid, uh, you can use vectors to navigate from one uh, vertex of the icosahedron that would be the pentamer to the next one. So for example here we have this arrangement and we can use a uh, vector this way. Uh, so now we are navigating uh, along this triangle. So we are going to pass through the center of each of these hexagons or hexamers if we see it in a molecular way. So we would go one in one direction and one in the other direction to find the next pentamer. So if we apply this formula, we can get that the T number is H, the square H, so H would be 1, and K would be 1 as well, so it would be uh, 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 1 is 1, plus time 1 times 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1 would be 3. So, what is this number telling us? Well, it's telling us how these different uh, subunits are arranged. It's going to tell us how many different, how, how many um, proteins we're going to find in a single vital particle. And it can also give us a sense of the side of, of the size, sorry, of the, of the vital particle. So the, if the T is 3, like we, are, uh, like we see here, we just need to multiply that by 60 to get the number of proteins that are going to be forming that capsid. So how many, if we have a T3 capsid, how many subunits would we have? 60 times 3, 180. Um, what is it called plus equivalence? Well, we call this would be this wouldn't be a plus equivalent because as we saw before, each of the subunits in this uh, capsule are going to be interacting with each other in the same way. But as you move. Uh, over in complexity, you're going to have different interactions. So these subunits are going to interact with each other to form a pentamer. The other ones are going to interact with each other to form an exomer. So that's how Fuller also built this geodesic dome. All the triangles are not exactly the same. They are um, changed in a way that they can all fit into into a sphere. So that's basically what viruses are doing as well. So let's see a higher T number here, for example. Um, here we have, so we navigate to the center of each of these exomers, and we have one and two to one side and one to another side. So what would the T number be for this one? So it would be 2 uh, times 2, it would be 4. 
4 times 1, sorry, uh, 2 times 1 would be 2, and then 1 times 1 would be uh, 1, so 4 plus 2 plus 1 would be 7. So if we have these, a virus that in which the side of the icosahedron looks like this, we're going to have a particle that's going to have 60 times 7 number of subunits. Um, I don't know how much that would be, 490? 490. 490. So, uh, viruses play with the, the different arrangements that you can have on this grid. So you can have different key numbers are represented here depending on, on how you play uh, with this triangulation. So I know this is hard to understand, it's harder to explain, so please ask me questions. I don't know if this is clear. Like for instance, on the simplest one, where the number is T number is one, and there's 60 subunits, 60 capsomeres. Right? Yeah. Is that as in those little circles of the, the subunits? Yeah. So the the circle would be the subunits. So. Oh, there's 60 of those in the simplest. Yeah, because you have an icosahedron that has 20 sides, and if each side has three, then you have uh, a total of 60. So what this formula is giving you is um, basically how, how many cats. It's not exactly how many uh, subunits are on one side. Um, but it's, I think it's like how many subunits you have like in a third of the side or something. So this would be three, yeah, that makes sense. So you would fit three, three here, three and three, and then three, nine, nine times 20, 180, yeah, something like that. So the, the T number multiplied by three would give you how many units you have on one side, and you multiply that by 12, you get how many you have in the whole capsule. So let, let's look at some examples to uh, see it more clearly. So I, I found this in the, in the web page of Protein Data Bank, um, and I found it very useful to, to see these triangulation numbers and how this theory of quasi-equivalence work. And they have origami that you can print and then you can fold as the ones that we have here. Um, so this would be the, the simplest example. It's a T1 capsid. Um, what you get in each side, you get uh, three subunits, and then you can fold, uh, and you can make satellite tobacco necrosis virus. That would be this thing, and we're going to see that as as we are trying to build uh, viruses with a higher T number, the area that we cover is going to be larger. So we're going to make uh, larger capsules as well. Um, so this is uh, T3. And the example here is to tomato bushes stunt virus. And I actually have this virus here. Um, so, and we can also see that when in the origami, the, the places where we have this corner here are the pentagons, and this is just the space that, um, that would be the, the capsomer that is missing in the pentagon. There's not a, an exomer. And that's what's going to give us the, allow us to close that into an icosahedron. So here we 
we can uh, see what's the, what the key number is. So we navigate one here and one to the other. And we have seen that that's a key three. And what the color means here is how different each of these subunits are going to be to each other. So this is the same protein, but the same protein is adapting different structures to, f to, to fill the space in a different molecular environment. So it's not going to be the same how the protein is going to be looking like in a pentamer and comparison as compar comparing to the, to the exomer. So I'm going to pass around uh, a 3D model of TBSV. Um, the cool thing about this model is that you can, you can look in the inside as well and you can see how different the pentamers are to the hexamers and you can, um, you can see how, how different they are. Then this one is a T4. So in the T4, if we look at the side of the icosahedron, we don't see an exomer here, and sometimes it's hard to find these, uh, to figure out this triangulation number. And it's because the hexagon is right here, hiding behind this panel of all these ones. So you have one and two on one side, zero to the other side. So that would be two times two is four. Oh, another thing that the T number is telling you, so we, I said that it's telling you uh, how the, the, the different proteins are going to arrange with each other, how many different how many proteins are going to be <coughs> in a capsid, but it's also telling you how many different conformations the same protein is going to have within the same capsid. So if we look at this, we can see there is a red, pinkish uh, one, an orange one, and a yellow one. These are the different, uh, the three different conformations that the virus is going to have. Then uh, this one you have four. So you have the, the pink, the orange, then you have light orange, and then you have yellow. Uh, this one is the T7, and then here you have um, one, two, three, four, five. I actually don't see the seven different conformations. Um, anyway, this would be a T7. Um, like bacteriophage HK97. Um, and we are gaining size and complexity. Uh, and then what happens if these pentamers are not distributed equally or regularly? Then you, we can make funky shapes like HIV, for example. Um, so we just. Whoop, Whatever we have the pentamers, we we are adding the curvature there. So in this cone, for example, we would have some pentamers here, but this looks more flat. There are no pentamers here. And as soon as we put pentamers, we get curvature there. Uh, these are just the images of the of the origami that you can make with these patterns. Um, so feel free to uh, take a look at any of these models, try to figure out what the triangulation number is. Uh, I'm going to see if we understand this. Uh, so what would you say the T number is for this virus in particular? So first thing we want to do is find the pentamers. Can we see the pentamers? So 
So here we have the pentamers. This would be inside of the icosahedron. Any answer? Okay, let's make it more easy. So what now we have identified the pentamers. Now we have to navigate from pentamer to pentamer through the exomers. So we're going to go to the center of each of the exomers to find the next pentamer. So we move one this direction, next one, and then one to the other side. Then this is going to be a T side. Can we see this? Okay, let's see if we can see this one. So I will make, I'm not going to make you calculate the T number of this one, because this is actually T31, which is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 square 5 would be 25. And then 5 times 1 is 5, 25 plus 5 is 30, and then 1 times 1 is 1, so 30 plus 1 would be 31. This is actually an a archaeovirus that was, which structure was discovered by Ken Stedman. Um, we see some decoration here as well in each of the pentamers. So if we look at the whole capsule, we can actually locate the pentamers very easily. So now we have a T31. How many subunits would uh, make up this structure? Or if you don't have a calculator, how can we know? Multiply by 60. This would have 1860 subunits forming this capsule. Um, yeah, any questions? It should be clear because uh, I'm afraid this is important. <laughs> uh, well, there are two slides. Very, very well, sorry, next to slide. One slide back to the uh, one T7 number, yeah. So I think this for me is looking at um, differentiating H from K. Like, so we're starting at a pentameter. Yeah. We're going into the center. Um, are those first, the two purple arrows seem to be the H's and the red seems to be the K? Is there? It, they are interchangeable. So it doesn't really matter. Okay, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. So, of course, there's exceptions as well. This is not a general rule. Uh, we have viruses like poliovirus, which is, if you look at this, if you just look at the structure and you find the pentamers, and then um, this would be the exomer that it actually looks like a kind of a triangular spiral. This would be what you think is a T3. But is it really a, a T3? Well, in poliovirus, there are three different uh, protein subunits that are going to form the capsid. So we are not actually having the same protein that's going to have three different conformations to form the capsid. We, Directly have just three different uh, classes of units, so that's what we talk. Uh, that's what we talk about pseudo equivalence. So the way we would uh, name the T number in this case would be with uh, P before the three. So the T number of poliovirus would be P three. Uh, Want to point out here as well the 
the protein structure of the capsid protein. This is a uh, beta barrel that uh, is called, uh, it has a jelly, jelly roll uh, type of fold. And this is something that is very uh, pervasive in, in, in capsids. Um, we, we, we find this uh, type of fold in many different uh, viral families, even if they, we, we cannot really find sequence similarity between them. Um, then we have uh, adenovirus. And this is, um, it has a T number of 25. Um, and then the exons are formed by trimers. Uh, we can see also these fibers that are located where the, the pentamers are. Um, this one is um, algal virus uh, that has some membrane inside the virus, and it has a T number of P169. So it has a giant genome, so now it's trying to make a giant capsid. This one has uh, 5,040 different sub, uh, subunits. I mean, they are not all different, sorry. Uh, but uh, some of them are, and that's why there is a P here. And then we have Mimi virus, giant, ginormous virus. Uh, this one is Sacantamoeba polyphaga Mimi virus, and the T number is 1,179. So if you multiply that by 60, you get more than 70,000 subunits that are going to arrange to form this capsule. Then we have viruses like this one, SV40. This one is formed just by one type of uh, protein, so it's not a, it doesn't have the, what's called the pseudo-equivalence. And it has 360 subunits, uh, which is very strange because there is no way to get a T number of six by tr uh, triangulation. So what this virus is doing is it's actually fitting pentamers where we should have exomers. So this would be what it would look like. So we would have pentamer here, here, and here. But these hexagons actually con contain uh, pentamers. There are some viruses that can um, form uh, covalent bonds between uh, the capsid units. So this is one, once all the capsid gets assembled, um, they, they actually form peptide bonds between the subunits, and this is what it's going to confer this particle of a lot of resistance. So even though the particle is going to be, have a very thin shell, it's going to be very resistant. OK, let's look at the helical symmetry. So some viruses can also just arrange uh, all these capsid site units in a helical fashion. Uh, so we have here the nucleic acid in red, and they're going to sit on top of these proteins that are each of the capsid subunits, and they're going to form a helix. So the, the cool thing about uh, helical viruses is that all the subunits are going to interact with each other in an identical fashion. It's not like the quasi equivalent icosahedral um, structures where we find that the, the, the protein has to adopt different conformations. Here, the same protein is just looking the same all around. And it can also get as big as needed. So if the DNA is longer, you just need to add more subunits. The problem 
is the the, the ends are open. Um, and then we can also make a calculation of how many uh, subunits we have in these capsets. Um, so in a similar way that we apply the uh, formula with the icosahedral viruses, here we can calculate the pitch. And this is something that um, Francis Craig and his body put together um, right before Casper and Plug uh, came up with the theory of quasi equivalence. Uh, so you just need to know how many subunits you're going to have per turn of these helix. There's going to be subunits per turn and then also the, the displacement. So if we think of these helix as, a, as this planar grid that we then roll to each other, then we can have these subunits connecting with this one, and then the displacement would be one, but if this one connects with this one, the helix is gonna come more uh, this way, instead of going like this, it's gonna like, open up, and you're gonna have different stairs going up. So by multiplying how many subunits you have per turn, you, by the displacement, you get how many uh, subunits you have in a particle. Um, oh, oh. And then you have complex vir viruses like, sorry. I have a question about yeah. the helical virus. Is the inside hollow? Is it just? Yeah, it's hollow. Is it just like open or is there? So I think they don't have anything inside. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know, actually don't know if that has a function or... Um, the one of the or something that protects the ends. I mean, like, like some other like capping protein or something. There are some viruses that do. They have, like, different structures, and some of them don't. And i actually not sure what uh, consequences that might have. I don't know if they are more uh, susceptible to degradation. Um, I don't know. I guess you can ask. Let's say, let's say. and then um, we can find complex viruses that have both. So here, for example, this phage of a giant head has a T number of twenty-seven, and then it has a tail that has helical symmetry, and this is contracted. And here we can see how we can have different displacements. Uh, uh, as I was telling before, so if we follow one line of subunits that are purple, they're, they're gonna come like one, two, three, four, five, six after. So here we'll have a displacement of six, and if we have 10 subunits per turn, then we will have um, 60 subunits. Um, I'm sure there are more, but. So I guess the class is over. Um, I'm sad I couldn't go through the uh, assembly stuff because I made a really cool toy that I wanted to show, but. Um, That's three minutes ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, made a video in case it didn't work, but. I hope I can make it work. So I made this kind of capsid in which we have um, the pentamers, the different pentamers. I put magnets that are gonna recreate the chemical interactions that put the different pentamers together. Here as well some um, genetic material. So. The capsid proteins are also interacting with the nucleic acid. Some of them uh, have basic residues facing the inside of the capsid, so they can interact with the nucleic acid. Um, so 
I put some vector to recreate that type of interaction. So we can put here, we can submit separately. And this is a new DNA that I just got, so I don't, I don't know if it's going to work, so I'm going to race with myself with this video. So I have the subunits here, put the DNA inside. very well the size of my DNA, so <laughs> I didn't quite get it inside, but um, yeah, this is just to illustrate that some viruses just by how they have, how evolution has shaped um, how the different amino acids are arranged in the protein uh, that forms the capsid can make the particle self-assemble in a certain environment is really cool. I don't know if you all saw that, but it works. <laughs> okay, thank you.